This is a pocket watch in a beautiful gold case, but its tragic story is unlike any other told on this channel. It is a family heirloom of a viewer named Linda who asked if it could be restored to working order. Now, this watch originally belonged to Linda's grandfather, who was a sheep rancher in western Colorado. It was handed down and her brother actually inherited the watch when her mother passed away almost 35 years ago. Knowing how much the heirloom meant to Linda, her brother promised her that he'd give it to her after he got to wear it to his daughter's wedding if she got married. But then, in July of 2021, her brother's home in the foothills above Denver burned down in a fire. He had kept the watch in a library desk drawer on the ground floor of the house. The home was fully engulfed and the roof had collapsed, which prevented firefighters from going inside. So they sprayed the house with water for two days. As a result, the ground floor was full of water. A woman from the restoration company asked if there was anything special she should search for in the rubble. He told her about the watch and was thrilled she actually found it. As it turns out, Linda's niece got married this year, and her brother, true to his word, surprised her with the watch for her birthday. The case was still beautiful, but the movement... <gasps> the water damage is extensive. Initial discussions we had about what to do included the possibility of just replacing the movement. While that could always be the last resort, Linda agreed to allow me to try and repair the existing movement, preserving the original components as best as possible. Particular focus would be on repairing anything that's considered unique to the movement, which includes the components that have the matching serial number stamped or inscribed on them. And my reasoning was this. Similar to the questions raised in the Ship of Theseus thought experiment, I had to carefully consider how many of the movement's original components could be replaced before it is no longer considered the same movement. If the movement's identity is defined by its serial number, can I replace everything except for those components? What if a numbered component absolutely had to be replaced? Would Linda still accept the watch as the same one passed down from her grandfather? In any case, the next step is to take stock of what's damaged beyond repair, what's repairable or could be restored, and what could simply be replaced for cosmetic purposes. I carefully lever up the dust cover that surrounds the movement with the screwdriver. The internal components, such as the pinion leaves, don't look too bad. I suspect the water damage is really limited to the balance side of the movement. The balance staff itself actually looks healthy. Carefully loosening up the stud screw so I can poke out the hairspring stud to make it a little easier to remove the balance. With the hairspring stud removed from the balance cock, I can now remove the balance cock from the movement. Of course, with a little bit of rust, everything's still stuck together. With a little convincing, it does come apart. The upper balance jewels actually look fine. The lower balance staff pivot looks fine. However, the top pivot has a little bit of scoring at the tip. I think I can work that out with the burnisher. The hairspring, that's going to be a lost cause. In fact, just for fun, I did try to dip the hairspring in Evaporest, and it actually disintegrated. I 
At this point, I had also decided to completely replace the regulator. The jewels are now removed for further cleaning and inspection. The tip of the ratchet wheel click is exposed through the rim of the plate, making it convenient to let down the main spring. The screws were a bit stuck, but luckily all of them came out without major issues. The barrel bridge is lifted away. Notice the serial number stamped underneath. With the bridge out of the way, the barrel can be lifted off the ratchet wheel and slid out of the movement. The barrel lid is also stamped with the serial number. The arbor looks fine, as does the main spring. However, I'm not going to be taking any chances with this one. The movement will receive a fresh white alloy mainspring to replace it with. The inside of the barrel bears the same serial number as the other components. As with any full plate movement, the top plate is removed by carefully sliding it away from the pallet fork, which you can see protruding into the recess where the balance once sat. This top plate also bears the full serial number of the movement and will be preserved as well. The lower balance hole and cap jewels are removed for inspection and cleaning. And now the pallet fork, escape wheel, third wheel, and fourth wheel are removed for inspection and cleaning. The center wheel, also known as the second wheel, is removed after I can get to the other side of the movement. The dial is removed using three foot screws that are along the rim of the movement. The hour wheel is removed. And I'll use the Presto puller to remove the cannon pinion, which frees up the center wheel on the other side. The minute wheel is now removed. This little plate is removed, which provides access to remove the ratchet wheel and the click. And now I'll remove the lever, which is partially corroded, and then the remainder of the keyless works.
These two screws free up the internal stem on the other side. I'll remove this partially corroded spring, which is responsible for the proper function of the keyless works. I carefully inspect every part during disassembly to avoid any surprises later on. It was at this point I discovered a big old crack in the lower pallet fork jewel. I'll get to that later. When dealing with a movement in this condition, the pre-cleaning ritual is key. Plenty of care and attention is spent pegging all the jewels and pivot holes, scrubbing away the corrosion and grime, and this is all before everything goes into the cleaning machine. Several of the pivots have surface corrosion, but this can be remedied on the Jacquet tool. If you recall from my earlier videos, the tool does remove a tiny bit of material, but it actually work hardens the surface, smoothing it over onto itself. I'll begin with the scored balance staff pivot, and then address the wheel pivots after they've been treated with Evaporust. The scoring is gone now, and the pivot is only smaller by a couple thousandths of a millimeter, which will not introduce any meaningful side shake within the whole jewel. As for the wheel pivots, they too cleaned up quite nicely. Back to that cracked jewel. There are two kinds of plate jewels in this movement. Those that are in a setting that are screwed into the top plate and easily swapped, and then there is this kind, which is what we call the rubbed-in jewel, on the lower plate. I will use my sight's jeweling tool to carefully press out the broken jewel. These punches contain a spring-loaded tip to aid in centering it over the hole.
The jewel sort of sits on a ledge within the hole, so it will only press out of one side. A stump is chosen to accept the debris of the jewel when it's pushed out of the plate. Might as well mark the patient. I'd hate to amputate the wrong leg. The micrometer dial at the top of the tool provides precise control of the depth of the punch. While this is used more for gauging the depth of friction fit jewels in more modern movements, I'm using it to avoid punching straight through the plate, potentially damaging the brass lip that needs to be reused. These are double-ended jewel setting tools of varying sizes, used to install rubbed-in jewels. On one end, tightening the screw expands the tool that allows me to gradually widen the brass lip of the plate so that the hole accepts the new jewel. I add a bit of lubrication to the hole and slowly work the lip open with the tool. The donor jewel is inserted into the hole and is placed on the little ledge at the bottom. The other end of the jeweling tool is concave. Tightening the screw on this end of the tool closes the tip, gradually folding over the lip of brass to secure the jewel into the plate. The jewel is now rubbed into place and I can proceed to double check proper fitment with the pallet fork. I'm checking for freedom of movement and a reasonable amount of end shake, end shake being the vertical free play of the pallet fork. A bit of Mobius D5 lubricates the bottom of the barrel. This white alloy mainspring comes pre-coiled in its holder from the factory. All that's needed to be done is to align the tab on the tail with the slot in the barrel and simply press it down the rest of the way. Here I'm verifying the tab actually made it into the notch in the barrel. The main spring and hole for the arbor are lubricated with D5. The arbor is inserted through the inner coil of the spring. Off screen, I place a little D5 on the hole of the barrel lid. And now the barrel lid can be installed over the main spring. I can snap it shut with the help of this anvil. The staking set provides a convenient and safe way to reinstall the jewel settings that were removed for cleaning. The upper balance jewels are now reinstalled. The whole jewel is inserted first, followed by the cap jewel. These two screws secure the settings in place.
I'm using my new to me automatic oiler to insert the precise amount of oil through the hole jewel. And the same process applies to the installation of the lower balance jewels. The benefit of using the version 1A automatic oiler is it deposits the same droplet of oil each time, which is important for maintaining consistent performance between both the dial up and dial down positions. Reassembly continues with the dial side of the movement. I chose to replace many of the springs, including this click spring from a donor. A touch of D5 to lubricate the post where the click will be installed. The ratchet wheel is installed and I'll make sure it's positioned properly relative to the click before covering it with the guard plate. On to the keyless works. A new intermediate setting gear spring is fitted into position. The keyless works is generally a high friction subsystem, so I'm lubricating the contact surfaces with Mobius D5. The crown wheel and transfer winding wheel are lowered into place. The intermediate setting gear is placed over its spring. I find it helpful to press on the base of this spring while lowering the keyless bridge so that the intermediate gear doesn't fall off its post. A bit of D5 lubricates the inner rim where the internal piece of the bridge will rotate against. The lever set spring is now installed. Finally, a fresh setting lever is now installed. I'll get the screw started by a few threads before situating the lever against its spring. Then I'll tighten it down the rest of the way. I place a small amount of Mollycoat DX grease on the tip of the lever that pushes and slides against the corner of the keyless bridge. A new keyless work spring is installed on the opposite side of the plate. I'll need to align the foot of this spring with the post of the keyless bridge protruding from the other side. This spring moves the keyless assembly back to the winding mode when the setting lever is pushed back into the movement. Next, the internal winding stem receives a small amount of DX grease. Its associated brass component is screwed to the plate from the other side. Testing winding mode. Now setting mode and a return to winding mode. Assembly continues with the train of wheels. This is the center wheel, also known as the second wheel. The main spring barrel is the first wheel in the train. The fourth wheel comes next, it sits lower than the rest. And down goes the third wheel. Finally, the escape wheel, or the fifth wheel in the train. Each of the pallet fork jewels receive a droplet of Mobius 941.
Because the horn of the fork needs to protrude into the area of the balance roller, it's easier to first install it onto the top plate and secure it there with a piece of Rotico. The plate can then be lowered onto the main plate, at which point the Rotico can be removed. Off camera, I ensure all pivots are located in their respective holes. The screws are tightened down once certain all the pivots are where they need to be. If you're unsure, just snug them up lightly then test for freedom in the train, before tightening them down the rest of the way. Just nudge the center wheel slightly, and it should trigger immediate movement all the way to the pallet fork. The case screws are reinstalled, but this could have also been done later as well. Before installing the mainspring barrel, a bit of D5 is placed along the inner edge of the hole where the arbor will rotate. The barrel is now slid into place, ensuring that the winding square of the arbor inserts into the square of the ratchet wheel on the other side of the plate. Sometimes it's helpful to hold the movement and shift things around to get them to align. Alternatively, the ratchet wheel could be installed towards the end of the process, thereby eliminating this slight annoyance. With a little D5 on the top of the arbor, the barrel bridge is now installed. All upper and lower train wheel pivots are lubricated with Mobius 9010. A fresh set of Church 1885 regulator components are now installed. Many of these small parts do not define the identity of this movement, and a fresh set does contribute to the overall aesthetic. The hairspring stud screw is now installed. This is a hairspring from a donor. There's no telling what kind of condition it's in, so I'm fitting it here first without the balance to test for alignment and concentricity. It's only a little bit off, and a few simple nudges is all it needs. I'll now check to ensure the terminal curve is correct by moving the regulator to other positions. The hairspring should still be centered over the jewel. The hairspring can now be fitted to the balance, the original balance. Yes, it shows signs of corrosion, but this is one of the parts that has a matching serial number which is inscribed under its arms. I'm sure the temperature compensation properties of this wheel can be called into question, but at room temperature, on a shelf, this wheel is still capable of keeping good time. The hairspring stud is inserted into the hole, and the set screw is tightened to secure it into place. I ensure the terminal curve once again lands between the regulator pins. After several winds of the main spring, I'll soon find out if this watch will run again after all the trauma it has endured. Testing the pellet fork, it has a healthy snap to it. To avoid an overbanked state, the balance is lowered down such that the impulse jewel lands on the outside of the fork horns. When rotated around, the fork horns will receive the first pass of the impulse jewel to begin the escapement. And it springs to life. Can you hear it? The time grapher sure does. 
Disregarding the beat error, this watch is running so fast it thinks it's a 19,800 beat per hour movement. It really should be 18,000 beats per hour. This folks is a real life example of how a hairspring that is vibrated specifically for one movement is not completely compatible with another. This hairspring came from another 17 Jewel model 1883, but due to all the variations of the 1883 that Waltham produced over the years, it's no surprise I find myself in this situation. Since the movement is running fast, I can either elongate the hairspring, which isn't an option because there isn't any excess to pull through the stud, or I can add weight to the wheel. Turning out the timing screws is not an option as it wouldn't cover nearly enough ground as I need. So I will literally add more of them in equal pairs, fine tuning with timing washers as needed until 1. The movement is running at 18,000 beats per hour, 2. It can keep time with a regulator in a reasonable position, and 3. The balance wheel is in poise, thereby reducing positional variation. Better? It's really close, now that I've added some more screws. I'll dial it in more with some washers, and now that I'm almost there, I'll go ahead and correct the beat error. Regulation will be tuned again 24 hours after the full wind, but now I'll proceed with finishing up by installing the cannon pinion and the minute wheel. The hour wheel is now installed. The dial washer is laid over the hour wheel. This little piece of curved brass is present in most watches and serves to limit the vertical movement of the hour wheel between the cannon pinion and the dial. The three foot screws are tightened to secure the dial. The second, hour, and minute hands are now installed with the help of a hollow faced punch while protecting them with a sheet of film. Finally, the dust ring is now reinstalled around the edge of the movement. Now I can replace this broken hunter crystal. I was able to source a replacement labeled with the size I need, but as luck would have it, it was actually slightly larger than stated. This is not uncommon with new old stock crystals, which never seem to be perfectly round or just flat out mislabeled. Of course the seller refused to accept the return, so it's time to improvise. I'm using a Dremel with a stone wheel to gradually reduce the diameter. A little water is used for dust control. like a glove. Before casing the movement, I did give the stem a thorough cleaning to remove any of the surface rust that was still on it. The case screws can be tightened now securing the movement in the case. With this being a lever set movement, the stem is fixed and therefore there's no stem sleeve. A small set screw holds it in the case.
I want to thank you, Linda, for trusting me with such a treasured family heirloom. It was an absolute joy breathing new life into this P.S. Bartlett, and I trust it'll help you feel closer to the spirit and memory of your grandfather for many years to come. I hope you all learned something from this video today, and if not, I hope you at least found it enjoyable. Thanks for fixing watches with me today, and I'll see you in the next one.